So my name is Pema Naruzi. Uh, I'm a product manager in the CTO organization at Bloomberg. And today I, with me, I have Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Keppel, a software engineer and the architect on the model registry we're going to be presenting. And uh, we're going to talk about model management. Um, I'm going to cover some of the problems that we identify from model management. And then Eric is going to cover how we came up with the solution and how OCI plays a part, a core part of that solution. OK, if you attended the keynote, you probably have seen these slides, a portion of it. But uh, I'm going to quickly go over what we do at Bloomberg. Bloomberg is a technology company that provides uh, software solutions for financial professionals in the finance industry. Uh, we, uh, one of our main products is called Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, and Bloomberg Terminal provides many functionalities that allows users to get access to raw data, insights, uh, analytics tools and communication tools. The scale of our operation is quite massive. We process large chunk of data on a daily basis. You can look at some of these numbers, they're quite large, and these are all daily numbers, the amount of data we, we process. And because of this large amount of data that we process on a daily basis, it's super important for this data to be structured in a way that is useful and digestible for our users. And uh, because of that, AI, you know, recently there are a lot of hype around AI, large language models, open AI. But AI has been a big part of our product uh, and big part of our culture. Uh, we've been working on AI products for the past 15 years and uh, since 2009. And because of this, we have over 300 plus developers, researchers that work on machine learning. And they create, and they have expertise in natural language processing, machine learning, information retrieval, search. And uh, they deliver uh, products that allows us to deliver value through the Bloomberg terminal, other products that Bloomberg has. And internally, we have a platform called the Data Science Platform. And the Data Science Platform provides infrastructure that is optimized for machine learning use cases. Think GPUs for training, high performance computing, uh, inference in the keynote, we touched on some of these. Uh, our colleague kind of went over those. And we also provide services and tools uh, that makes these infrastructure really use, usable for our users to be able to do the whole process and deliver value with machine learning. And they do this by going over uh, model development lifecycle, have a um, diagram of how, how that looks like. It's a very simplified version of that. But um, you could think of every single stage here as a process that a developer or a person will go through to be able to complete the task. And for every single step, we provide uh, you know, platform offerings that allows uh, our users to be able to complete the task. Uh, starting from data gathering and exploration, we have Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, all the way to pipelines, you have Argo. Um, you know, all of them are built on top of Kubernetes. And uh, you could also see some of these logos. Open source is a big part of our culture, is a big part of uh, Bloomberg and our platform as a whole. Uh, in many cases, we contribute to open source project, we use open source project, and in some cases, we also you know, start open source project. One of the main things you could see here is for our managed serving, we have uh, KSERF, which was co-started by us, Google, and IBM. It used to be called KF Serving, uh, and a name changed to KSERF, and uh, it's growing qu quite fast. Um, and uh, earlier today, my colleague Dan Sun uh, kind of was uh, going over that and how, how fast it's growing. And we are actually uh, trying to transition that uh, to CNCF. There's a proposal for that. Now, going back to the visualization I had around model development lifecycle, um, I think one word really pops up uh, quite strongly in this diagram. It's repeated like over you know, almost all stages. Can you guess what that word is? Yeah, so I didn't make this diagram to make it seem like model's important because I made the slides, but it actually is quite important. That's why it's called model development lifecycle. Uh, and we kind of looked at this and we saw parallels to code when it comes to software development lifecycle. Um, they're quite similar in terms of the objective you have in code um, for software and then model for model development lifecycle. And we saw that for code, there are mature tools that allow you to manage uh, code from the beginning to end in that process. But question is, can you use the same tools for model uh, and be able to do the same process um, and accomplish what you need to do? So what we ended up doing, we ended up kind of looking at the industry. We looked at users, see what they do, how do they manage models, how do they store them, how do they use them? And we asked ourselves, 
can you just use what tools we have for code and repurpose them for model? Well, if we could, then I guess I will not have a presentation. <laughs> uh, you can't, and I think the reason for that is um, the user base that you have for model is not the same as, as code. Um, so one of the things I think I want to highlight here, I, I, ML developers that are actually d delivering value with machine learning, um, they have a different set of needs than, than software engineer uh, in software development lifecycle. In here, ML developer is representing multiple um, roles. Uh, it's not one singular role. Some, some folks do data science, some do engineering, some do research. But ultimately, there's a collaboration that happens between these user bases to actually deliver value. So what they really care about is being able to deliver that value fast. They want to be able to use tools that are really intuitive and easy to use. Experimentation is super important in machine learning. Evaluation is super important in machine learning. It's the process you go through to create this artifact. The artifact is, um, is predictive, uh, so you need to be able to experiment a lot. You need to be able to evaluate. You need to be able to use the tools that are really easy to use, and collaboration is a big part of that process. But just because the user base is different, doesn't mean some of the core concepts that are part of the software development lifecycle and tooling that exists for it are not relevant. Um, so proper versioning and immutability are still relevant in the, in the process you go through to deliver value with models. Proper release process, provenance, auditability, compliance checks are all relevant still. Uh, so you want, you want these things. Um, and if you really think about it within, you know, Bloomberg is the, uh, the way our user kind of, uh, the users that we have, uh, in most companies, ML developers are, you know, you have data scientists, you have ML engineers, you have production engineers. But in Bloomberg, we usually have one engineer be able to actually do end-to-end -end process. Uh, they do experimentation, and they're usually also responsible for taking that thing to production as well. Um, and because of that, this issue is, is even more important for us. Uh, they're optimizing for speed, uh, for delivering value, machine learning moves fast, but they need to also make sure they take care of the software best practices and, and actually have a process to be able to, to deliver that value. So we believe we need to bring these two together. And this is where the concept of model registry came, came to be. It's a, it's a name that we have for it internally um, for the product. And it tries to really make software pra best practices part of the process for these machine learning developers, um, but without slowing them down, without forcing them to change their workflows, to adhere to some tools that were ex uh, you know, made for software engineers and code lifecycle. So uh, what are the requirements? Uh, so this is the PM edition of those requirements. Usually these are much longer. I condensed it for this presentation, but uh, uh, it's pretty much around two big, big concepts. One is you need to make sure to allow these developers to do the work they want to do, uh, experiment, collaborate. At the same time, make sure the software, software best practices are ingrained in the platform itself. And uh, when they use the tool you provide, they don't really have to worry about a lot of these pieces for software best practices. It's kind of part of the platform itself. And like any other offering within the data science platform, within our platform internally, we have some non-negotiables, you could call them. Um, we want to make sure that whatever we provide is cloud native. It's built on top of existing solutions that people you know, worked on. Um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel if it already exists. And in some cases, we may you know, make something and collaborate and, and release it for other people to use. We also need to make sure uh, that we provide a solution that works both on premises and the cloud, um, hybrid, I don't want to make the statement, but is the future, so we need to make sure that it works in both environments seamlessly. And uh, it should be multi-tenant. We have uh, multiple tenants within our platform, so that, that's kind of a non-negotiable thing. And then lastly, but definitely not least, it needs to work really well with the rest of our platform. Um, so the ultimate goal of our users, uh, maybe at one, two, or a team, is to deliver value. And for them to deliver value, they're going to be using a bunch of tools, and those tools need to just work together. And if they don't work together, there's going to be a weak point in the process. So it needs to work really well with the rest of our platform. And with that, uh, I'm going to pass it to Eric that's going to cover how we, uh, what solution we came up with. Thanks, Ben. OK, so here we go. Here's the fun part. So we want to build the model registry. What does this sound like? So these are some concepts that Maybe a default position has to be horizontally scalable. 
we heard him talk about multi-tenancy, where enterprise organization teams need isolation from one another, multi-cloud, as different providers gain different capabilities, you know, we need to be positioned for that on-prem. Uh, Bloomberg does a lot of its core computation on-premises, so not negotiable. Authentication and authorization. We all hear the hubbub about like model security, model transparency, observability. How are you guaranteeing security around your assets? And lastly, I'll put in kind of from the software world, digesting and signing. So how do you know I delivered exactly what you asked for? No problem, right? Sounds easy. But I haven't even like gotten to the ML parts. So we also have this entire domain of like, what is a model? Is it partitioned? Is it large? Is it small? Uh, what's, happening what's happening tomorrow? So the questions go on and on and on. So how do you avoid going into this rabbit hole? Well, you buck up. So we're going to go shopping. We're going to go shopping for this model registry. And these are the primary things that I'm going to be looking for. So it needs some storage. It needs to scale. It needs redundancy concepts. So if a file disappears, the file is still there. Partitioning support uh, frameworks are now sharding things. We want to be able to do distributed pulls. We want to be able to like, feed into data frames and, and all these things. Format. So sensibly, some things metadata and binary. But how are we structuring that? Is it extensible? Um, one of the things that I hear as I, as I listen to everyone is like everything always starts at S3. Like, just get your stuff in S3, and we'll take it from there. Is that really where the story starts? Um, security. Going to not ask for a whole lot here, you know, basic ACL, you know, your POSIX kind of ideas. But how easy does it integrate into your systems, your, dom your user domain, your verification services, et cetera? And lastly, is kind of the capstone on it all. It's like, OK, you've created all this stuff. How do you find it, and how do you manage it? And does it fit back into lifecycle concepts? So uh, let's go shopping. Oh, turns out you can't really find this on the store. So we're going to DIY this. So manager asked me, how long is it going to DIY? I say, oh, I'm going to, it's really going to have we have to build the server for 300 developers and all these products. I might get to the machine learning, but really in the back of my head, I'm like, oh my god, i got to scale this thing. It's got to run in multiple data centers. I have people working on sensitive stuff. I have people working on public stuff. Um, this is what I want. I want to like get rid of all of that infrastructure stuff and just go deep into the domain, because that's where the fun is. So, we spin off, we're looking at ways to like bootstrap S3, use databases, like all, all, all this crazy stuff. But I'm also looking at what OCI and ORAS is doing. And I hope you're out there because you guys are awesome. Um, so with Helm, there's this idea of an artifact that if you strip away the runtime of the container, you're left with this kind of metadata and these blobs. So what else could you possibly do with this? So this is where I started to see, like, hmm, registries are ubiquitous. Every provider has one. We have multiples at our organization. Is this possible to just use this? And what is it? OCI has kind of three core ideas. There's the distribution spec, so RAST, you're shipping uh, images around. What is the image? So that's the image spec that defines uh, how you construct these things. And lastly is the runtime spec, which I'm not going to touch on in this particular talk, but it's like, how do you execute this file bundle? Particularly, the registries kind of stood out. So it's a basic repository. You just stick content addressable tar files in it, digest the tar, and that becomes its location. And it supports these really common workflows, so push, pull, list, update, CRUD kind of stuff. 
Um, so we started looking at the reference implementation for this, and I really liked what I saw. The images, really all they are is kind of this JSON. You know, there, there is some uh, talk around YAML, but uh, practically speaking, everything is JSON. Um, and then you're, you're basically just lining up these tar files behind it. Very rudimentary, but like, it has digesting, so I can prevent tampering. I can do checksums. It has versioning and take supports, both on the spec side and on the artifact side. And then we have all this supply chain tech that can scan these TARs and tell us our licenses in check, are there vulnerabilities, et cetera, et cetera. That would make security people very happy. And what they look like under the hood is, I present here, there's not really much to know other than there's kind of this type idea and you have these layers um, and there's front matter and URIs. And so you can start to kind of pick up on some of these keywords. Um, and that OCI11 added this custom artifact type, which is kind of key to this. I'm not going to delve into it, but there's a, a slide on the end if people want to download and kind of look into that. So can these concepts provide a foundation for what we're trying to do? Well, let's go back to our shopping list. So I'm looking for scale and resiliency and partitioning. So what is a registry node? It's basically a stateless service that sits on top of your storage provider. That means you can just line them out east to west and take on the load that you want. They also have this concept of storage redirects. So as you hear like people focus on LLM and S3, like I can kind of sleep at night thinking, okay, I can just redirect them to S3 and pick up whatever optimization other people are working on. And you can stick a blob cache in there too, so you're really not hitting S3 as much as you think. But the key part of this is registries are everywhere, like I said earlier. All major cloud providers have them, and there's a large assortment of toolkits to like move stuff in between or to, to work against them. So I'm pretty happy with this, all right? So I put my storage in my shopping cart. So now I'm gonna go looking at formats. What is an OCI image artifact? Um, it's a stack of blobs. One is a config, so that's a metadata, and then the less is the content. So when you're using a container, this explodes into what you see on the left. But what if a model is ostensibly the exact same content? In 1.1, they also added this notion called an artifact type. So you can now specify a custom type. So maybe it's no longer this container, it can be whatever you, your client deems it to be. That's a lot of jargon, so what does this look like? What am I proposing for the user? So we have a builder API, they're building this conceptual container, they're putting in their model files, maybe their model cards, their metadata, really, we're not gonna like hold them back too much. They can do the layout that they want, et cetera. So when they close this up, it's pressed into the artifacts that I've been describing, or the OCI images. This is then pushed to a registry. They returned a logical URI at this point, and so this is kind of a key distinction. Like kind of going back to the S3 case, like what region am I in? What cluster am I in? What's my bucket? Like all this stuff. I wanted to kind of avoid that. So I'm kind of following the, the Docker paradigm here, of just like give me the thing and version five. So lastly, we'll touch a little bit on this in the end, but so you've created this thing and now enters the life cycle of our system and you can experiment, serve, and maintain these artifacts. But what does that mean for the end user or for the person you're sharing your, your creations with? So again, you give them this logical UI, you know, go use model version five. They pull this, it explodes to the system, and they can now use whatever was pushed. But we've actually taken this one step further. So like Payman mentioned, um, our, 
our KSER project has native integration with this, so you can just say like, okay, I wanna launch URI in KSER if you push a button and you're ready to send requests. There is a key point that I'll kind of touch on later in, within that story that really came from the product side. Um, so I'm pretty happy with this. I can, I can store metadata, I can store binary, I can spec it, I can version the spec, I can version the content. That sounds great. It's got checksums, all this stuff. So security. This is kind of like one immature part of OCI. They don't really give you a lot of control. So on their OAuth implementation, you basically just get a name and then a few actions, so push, pull, delete. Um, they do have a working group on this, so I expect it to, to go further, but we wanted to support tenancies, and so basically you have to provide an OAuth provider that is able to work with these concepts, and so that's a little bit of how we did it. I think the more important part of security is like federating it. So I'm getting a little bit ahead, but one of the key parts of the system is that we can attach as many registries as we want. There's just a couple stip uh, stipulations on this registry is that it has to have an OAuth provider. Um, but most cloud providers have these, so I'm, you know, Cognito is an example of this. So it's really not a, a hurdle. So I got some basic security concepts. I know because it's OAuth, it, it kind of works into like a, a bunch of things on our platform. So now we have this discoverability question. So we're creating all of this stuff. How do we manage it and push it through a life cycle? So this is where our data science platform comes in. And because it's an internal tool, I can't really go into it too much. But the idea is that like someone can come to their tenancy, they can see what models they've created, they can see the origins or the experiments that created them. They can move them between registries. So if you have different registries with different providers, you could copy them out and you can manage that as a tenancy. So that is an, another level of, of an asset for you. And also like promoting and deprecation of models. Um, I think this is a really immature part of, of the machine learning publishing story of like the notion of kind of deprecation and versions. It's not something that you really hear a lot about when you're talking with MLOps people. So I'm whipping through a lot of stuff here. Like how do I bring it all together? So this is kind of our big picture. Um, you have an AML, AI ML workload somewhere. As long as it has an OI, OCI registry next to it, and as long as it has OAuth, we can then tie it back into the central cataloging and use that as a distribution point of our software. And I want to just shout out to like all the Otel people that are here because I've been trying to add Otel to this, and it's fantastic what you guys are selling to, to my team. Thank you very much. Um, Future possibilities, so unpacking to the current runtime. This is the, the kind of the one point that I wanted to talk back uh, to product was. So the story always starts at S3. Like you do some stuff, you put it in the bucket, and then the rest of the world takes it over. So they brought up this idea of like model as first class. And so I started thinking about this and it's like, I don't want my scientists to have to like upload stuff into S3 and think about logistics and manage keys and endpoints and all this stuff. Like they have the model, like why can't they just save the model? And so that's what we're trying to do. Like so they give the model, we save the model and we put it back into their runtime when they need it. Much more complex than it sounds, but uh, we're going for it. Um, more partitioning, so as things get bigger and as frameworks add more capability for sharding uh, to roll that back in. Attestations, this is kind of a personal uh, project of mine. Uh, you, you basically have um, SHA action SHA or URI action URI or uh, UUID action UUID. It all starts to like coalesce into this world of triples 
an arrow and you can graph and data frame it. Um, example of people working on this is some of the Git stuff that you've seen. It's really cool. I think if you can like include the provenance with, with your artifact group, like that's amazing. Um, and lastly, some of you might be thinking we could like DDoS ourselves. Uh, so we have been looking at well things like Dragonfly. So they put that over Harbor. Um, you can then kind of distribute the pulls if you're pulling a bunch of duplicate stuff. Um, I, I wanted to add a, one other thing to that was uh, the Seekable TARS is also something that uh, if, if you've looked at like Star GZ, cool stuff. I'd like to be able to pull something just enough for initialization and then let the other stuff lazy. Authorization granularity. So OCI has not really touched on authorization yet. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around it. Hopefully it can coalesce into something meaningful. Multi-tenancy. A lot of distros like Harbor, Keppel, um, Key, they all kind of focus around multiple tenancies. I think that's really important. I'm hoping that the reference distro gets it. And lastly, storage performance. So your models, as your models get bigger and get very bigger, like most of your latency is now in the storage layer, of which I don't own, of which I am not particularly monitoring. So how do you roll that back in? Like how, how do you um, protect yourself or like gear yourself up for more and more and more storage requirements? So I'm going to wrap it up there. That was a whirlwind. Uh, we only get a little bit of time, and this was a very big project. Um, if you want to hear more, obviously, you can come work with us. Um, we have positions all over the spectrum, from like data science to cloud engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Payman to close it up. Yeah, uh, that was great. So uh, please give us feedback. I have a QR code. Uh, scan it. and. You can uh, go to the shed app and give us, a give us your feedback. But with that, I think uh, we're done. We're open for questions if you guys have any. Uh, the woman in the red shirt has a mic. She can help. Um. Hi. Wait. Oh. oh thank you. So, uh, uh, does it mean you basically build a uh, in-house version of Olama, basically? Uh, Olama, you said? Yeah. So Olama, you're you're really kind of tying yourself to the the world of LLMs. Um, so we're actually tackling the problem. I would say a little bit higher than that. Test, test. So thank you. you. You mentioned that you can serve your models in KSERF. But for that, KSERF needs to understand how to run the model, right? So did you implement this runtime spec that you mentioned? Or are you just limited to a certain kind of model? For example, you assume that there is an Onyx binary inside of this artifact or a, a certain entry point. Or how do you do inference with the artifact that you generate? Um, so with inference, really, or let me put it this way, um, the runtime spec doesn't necessarily have to define exactly how something is run. So if you look at like how Docker uh, combines a runtime spec, it's got like users, environment variables, working directories, special paths. These are all important ideas that I can pass down to KServe that has nothing to do with how that model is executed. That's kind of you know where I, I'm taking it. Yeah, right now um, you can just pass that BRI as a as a new, as a identifier to KServe, and KServe can take that information that we have within that artifact and decide like what's the best way to run it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, excuse my naivety on the problem. But uh, first question is, how big of the 
model is. You know, you didn't mention that. And second would be how big of a challenge is that to use? Uh, you didn't convince me that how bad is a tree to you know mount an uh, S3, I don't know, storage uh, to your container. Uh, how big of a deal that? Uh, you didn't convince me that uh, it is a better approach. And finally, if you convince me that this is a really big uh, artifact, uh, let's say I haven't, I haven't convinced, but uh, what was the problem with uh, Git uh, artifact management that you didn't use? You know, uh, and last one, are those images, uh, versions, uh, whatever, are those immutable? Sorry for asking lots of questions. I want to take a stab at it. Can you repeat the first one again? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. I had the answer in my head. But... Uh, first of all, about the uh, model oh. size. Yeah. Oh, the S3. All right. So it's not so much the what S3 is, it's how people use it. So you just have Joe Schmo, Joe Schmo developer, like uploading whatever they want into S3. You know, that's not software lifecycle. That's like someone just pushing files. And so what I wanted was, like, the, the, the idea of S3 as storage is fine. It's really about, like, what someone is putting into it and, like, how you apply that regulation, how you apply that structure. I really want it just implicit. Like, I, I don't want to tell people, like, how, how CAS works. I don't want to. I don't want to tell them to use this cluster or that cluster. And so, really, um, my problem with S3 is just that it was it, it's it's too loose of a paradigm. It, it attracts cowboys. It it attacks it attracts a lot of problems. Um, second question: What was it? Uh, first one, to, to be honest, it was the second one. First one was model sizes. How big of you know, model is that? That I can't really go into like fine details. I'll refer you to our platform geniuses that are down here in the front row. Um, um, that that carry more weight than I do. It, it goes from small to large. Like we have large and we have small, like very small. So. Mm -hmm. And what was the third one? Oh, oh my God! Don't why not? Why not <laughs> okay. get? I think that was. Yeah, and the S3 thing, as you said, I think the issue is not S3. I think the issue yeah, is the lifecycle around S3. How do you like store, make sure that whatever you store is what ends up going to production, and when it goes to production, no one can go change their mind and delete sure. that blob. Uh, I guess if you set up a system to really you know, make that lifecycle happen, uh, there's nothing wrong with S3 itself. I take back my third question, go for the fourth. Uh, and I can add a new one. Are, are the images immutable? And how do you guarantee immutability? Uh, yes, everything's immutable. You, so in typical repositories, you might have the idea of like a snapshot being editable, but then a version being immutable. So right now, we're all in on the immutable side. We're opening up this experimentation workflow and seeing like how we can integrate that. Um, that the experiment side, I wouldn't call the artifacts themselves immutable, but your workflow will involve a lot of choices before you actually, or will give you the ability to have choices into which particular output you want to choose. Um, so maybe it's metrics driven, maybe it's test driven or evaluation driven. Um, I really want to kind of focus on that being where people can make choices and out of that process now it becomes this immutable versioned artifact that has a SHA digest that can be checksummed, that every place I put it using that checksum, I know exactly what bytes are there. Um, that's a powerful idea for me. OK, thank you. Uh, excuse me, what, uh, fifth one <laughs> is that uh, what is the frequency of generating new models? You know, uh, I can imagine whenever a developer pushes an image, you're going to create a new model and store it somewhere. Is it something like that? 
or it is uh, the question is um, how, how many models I guess how frequent uh, people yeah. store models and how do we how do we handle that if people run experiments and store models do we store every single model all I'll say is s3 is cheap very yeah. very <laughs> cheap <laughs> yeah so we do store a lot of, uh, when they, people run these models, we store them. Uh, we can certainly improve uh, how we tackle uh, checkpoints and, and, you know, iterative process of experimentation um, in terms of, like, do we keep every single artifact that was ever produced in the lifetime of every single project, that there may be some work there to make sure we don't keep everything and be smarter with the uh, retention of it. But besides that, we just store all of them right now. Are you taking advantage of layering uh, when keeping track of models li over a lifetime, or you maybe put fine tunes in a separate layer so you can dedupe, et cetera? Yeah, we're actually just starting to work into some of these ideas. Right now, our layering is primarily around sharding functionality that certain frameworks uh, provide, but we're hoping to like keep pushing into this further and further. Um, you know, it's not just models that we're thinking about. We're thinking about like all kinds of assets that are are used in this ecosystem. Um, but it could certainly possibly be a possible future where, like, if most of the model is the same all the time and a small portion of it only changes, there could be possibility of better layering to not change every single layer. Yes. Uh, May I ask you to something more in your shopping list as uh, governance? Do you plan to govern your models as uh, we can govern data set? So tracking, uh, tracking the versioning, tracking all the people, the stakeholder who have an impact in, in the stakeholder impacted your, your models. Uh, so the question is, uh, when it comes to governance, how do we think of that uh, and this intersection with data sets and data, uh, how data is governed, um, and the approach we're taking with models? Is that a question? Sorry. I, it's good. Yeah. I wouldn't say we've approached anything specific to data sets. Um, I think we're kind of... Well, the big question we're trying to answer is lineage, I guess. So from when something was trained or from whence it came. Outside of, I mean, I, I don't know if I have a succinct answer. So there's, there's risk concerns, there's software vulnerability, there's data privacy, um, there's your location, like what data center, what provider you're using and what kind of, security they provide there. Um, I think we've kind of just like, kind of, we've stuck to the basics for the moment. Like you, you can authorize people to update your stuff. You can authorize people to read your stuff. I think these concepts, or there's also ownership. I think these concepts kind of, uh, you know, carry over to data. Um, but I don't really have a cohesive story for you yet, I think. I'm sorry if I'm not understanding people. I, I don't hear very well, so I'm relying on Damon. Hey, hey, Eric. Hey, Payman. My name is Feynman. Uh, I'm so excited to hear that you leveraged Oras because I'm an Oras maintainer. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. I have two questions regarding your use case. The first one is regarding the uh, registry side. So you mentioned on um, OCI 1.1. So I'm curious, um, have you, are you built your container registry, your model registry on top of the um, distribution registry or you're leveraging some open source registries like Harbor? And is it an OCI 1.1 compliant registry? <laughs> Technically, we're still on, I guess, 283 in our production environments, but we're using that 3 alpha in testing. So, very good. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm riding a slim line between 1.0 and 1.1 right now, but as um, soon as uh, that reference implementation is pressed, uh, we're going to go forward. Okay. 
Uh, I have a second question. So the first one, I may need more. I may have more detailed conversation with you offline. Okay. Okay. The second question, um, you mentioned uh, you have some plans to enhance the security of your uh, OCI artifact distribution, right? So uh, you mentioned attestation. So can you clarify uh, what's your plan to um, add attestation to your to your ML models as OCI artifacts? And uh, have you noticed that there's a new feature in OCI spec, OCI image spec, and distribution spec that you can link uh, different OCI artifacts uh, in a relationship in the registry? So can you clarify uh, okay. your sec the plan for enhance your security of the OCI artifact distribution? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when when they are serialized, I. I think there's a couple spots that they can fit. So you, you can have like an inline blob descriptor is kind of one option. So you know the way that you might put base64 in like a style sheet or something like that. So that was kind of one idea. So like as you're building this artifact, that you're able to collate these attestations and actually like present them as descriptors in the manifest, like an inline descriptor. So that was one idea. The other is the one that you're talking about with referrers and subjects. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, how cool would that be if I could say, okay, for this artifact, give me all signatory A's or something like that, and it would be able to deliver those to me, or it would be able to tell me like whether or not there are subject artifacts out there in the registry. Um, it's all very cool stuff, and we're hope I'm hoping to leverage it. OK, thank you. Oh, and I'll make a call out on that, too, um, for like SIG store stuff. Like that, you know, being able to have a large user base easily sign things and, and not lose their private key. Like, Frameworks like SigStore are like, uh, you know, essential to these ecosystems, too. So um, if you're out there, I'm watching you, too. Hello. Uh, small question. Or, um, I think to have full uh, reproducibility, you need to have the exact same environment in training as in serving. So I'm thinking Python dependency packages except ver uh, exact same versions. Is it also something that is included uh, in the model, or do you tackle this? So in the model uh, registry, or do you tackle this in some other way? We haven't tackled that yet, but we intend to. So, so we're, we're bringing these worlds together, and hopefully um, they can share the same templates and, and everything. But um, at the moment, um, it's, it's more declarative, I guess, by, by the developer. We do track that in the platform, though. So we, we may not track that in the registry, but we have that information. And we do track links between these artifacts uh, or like the, how the artifact came to be. And we do track dependencies. We use build packs uh, for when people run, uh, when they create their images to be able to run them. So we, we do have the track of how an artifact came to be. may not necessarily be in the registry itself right now. All right, thank you. I'd like to see a metal model kind of materialize behind all of our platforms and it, it be cohesive and comprehensive. Um, you know, we're working towards these ideas. Yeah, we are out of time. So if you have questions, we're going to be around. Thank you. Thank you.